Hi there, I'm James Dapache, and this, this is Coffee and a Case Note. Team, today we are going to talk again <laughs> about derivative actions. We're talking about a minority shareholder today that owns a 13.25% stake in an entity that owns some assets. Good fun. This entity goes ahead and sells those assets. And those assets are sold in 2016 for $60 million. This happens. And it happens with the approval of the board of directors of the company. The transaction goes through. That's in 2016. Now, our minority shareholders are a little bit disappointed about the way the transaction's gone through because what they say is, well, hang on, that sale for $60 million was at an undervalue because the assets that were sold at the time were worth somewhere between $245 million and $900 million, right? And one of the things they point to is they say, well, <laughs> one of our pieces of evidence for saying they were worth that much is that only a partial amount of those assets were sold on in 2018 for 1.15 billion. Right? So in 2016, our purchaser pays 60 million for the whole thing. Then in 2018, our purchaser sells some of the assets and gets 1.15 billion for them. And so you can imagine the minority shareholders being a little bit disappointed. And indeed, that was the basis for their disappointment. What the minority shareholders said was, in essence, that in allowing this transaction to go through, the board of directors of the company that owned the assets had breached their director's duties. And they were agitated about this. And the minority shareholders applied to the court to try to get the court to allow them to run a derivative action, to let them stand in place of the company and prosecute the claim for a breach of director's duties. Now, as you may know, there are a number of criteria you have to meet to get up on a derivative suit. So let's work through those criteria. You can find these in section 237 of the Corporations Act if you're feeling interested. Now, the first criterion is, uh, is the company going to commence proceedings itself? And in this case, the court found it fairly easy to say, well, uh, the people who are going to be sued are the current CEO and three of the current directors, so uh, pretty safe to say the company's not going to go and sue those people. So that first element of the test was satisfied. The second element of the test that can allow a shareholder to set, sort of stand in the shoes of a company is, is that shareholder applying to do that in good faith? And here, uh, what the court found was that the minority shareholders, uh, if the claim was successful, because they were shareholders, they would share in some of the fruits of that claim. And so there was good faith on the basis that if the company wins, the shareholders win. And so the court finds that that's good faith. And in addition to, and on top of that, the minority shareholders had gone and obtained really rigorous advice from barristers and had gone through some document discovery proceedings and had prepared all the relevant evidence and that sort of stuff. And so from that point of view, the good faith argument was reasonably easy, uh, easily accepted by the court. So what have we got? We've got the company's not gonna sue. We've got the shareholders coming in good faith. Uh, the next question is, is there a serious question to be tried? Is there a real legal issue here that the shareholders are ventilating in relation to the company? The short answer to that is the court accepts, yes, there is a genuine question here as to whether or not the directors breached their duties in letting this $60 million transaction go through on the basis it should have been vastly more. So there is a serious question here. And so you might say the minority shareholders are looking pretty good at this stage because the first three criteria, uh, the, <laughs> the company's not gonna do it. They're coming in good faith, serious question. They've all been satisfied. Now, sadly, <laughs> if you're in the minority shareholders camp, their application to stand in the shoes of the company fails on the fourth criterion. Sorry, I just saw how strange that is to hold up your ring finger as I look in the, in the way this is videoed. Um, the fourth criterion is, is it in the best interests of the company to bring the claim? Now, um, for a number of reasons, the court finds no. 
Firstly, um, the potential defendants are the current CEO and some of the current directors, as I've just said to you. And so the idea of the company conducting litigation against its current leadership team, uh, that's going to be really disruptive and that's going to mess around with the company. Um, secondly, proceedings like this are going to really up the premiums and potentially put at risk the ability to get directors and officers insurance, DNO insurance, as some of you might know it. Uh, and that is not in the company's favour. It's not in the best interest of the company. Third, it's going to make it more difficult for the company to get finance. It's going to put their position with lenders at risk, and that's not in the best interest of the company. Fourthly, the minority shareholders offered an indemnity to say, look, if the court gives us leave to bring this derivative suit, if the court lets us stand in the company's shoes, we will pay all of the legal costs if the court orders the company has to pay legal costs. And what the court says is, yeah, that's fine, but there are other losses the company might suffer in addition to legal costs that that indemnity doesn't protect the company from. And then a fifth point that made it against the best interests of the company was that the actual evidence before the court um, is not really or was not really of a kind that was necessarily compelling and likely to make the company win. You know, if you think about it, um, the transaction in 2016, if you say, hey, the 2016 transaction was at an undervalue because there was a 2018 transaction that was much bigger, well, how much does the 2018 value inform the 2016 transaction? And this was a question that was asked in the context of the directors going back and forth at length with the management team and considering the transaction. And it was also a question asked in the context of the 2018 price being very high and the 2019 price being very low. And so the question is, well, if we're going to argue the 2016 value should be informed by some future price, why would we pick the high price? Why would we pick the high price rather than the low price? And so this hindsight problem, as you might describe it, uh, was sufficiently challenging for the court to say, mm, it's not clear that the company is going to get anything back from these proceedings. And so despite the fact the company's not going to claim, despite the fact the minority shareholders come in good faith, um, despite the fact that there was a serious question to be tried, the court found it was not in the best interest of the company to grant leave for the shareholders to stand in the shoes of the company and run that derivative suit. And so that is the end of that. Thanks for joining me. I hope that assisted you and I'll look forward to joining you again soon for another coffee and another case note. Cheers.